Welcome to Bits and Bytes. In this episode, we're going to see how the computer not only lets you play music, but play with music in all sorts of new ways. And you don't need to be musical to do this. If you have a bad ear for music, the computer can help train your ear. If you can't read music, the computer can help you to learn. Or if you like, it can create a new way of representing musical notes. Surely I'd need to plug in a whole lot of extra equipment if I want to make music on my computer. Not necessarily. It's true that as you progress, you can invest in extra equipment, but you can have a lot of fun with music just with your basic microcomputer, because when you buy a computer, you're also buying a musical instrument. There's already a program loaded into the Atari that does just that. Player piano. Hmm. Well. Hey, this is cute. So this is the bonus you get when you buy a computer? Yes. This type of program exists for all the computers. Of course, you can also keep a copy of the tune you play on the disc and play it back later if you want. To see how to do this, press the escape key. Type 2 to save memory data. And when you're tired of playing the piano, you could switch to the organ. Oh. Keyboard, organ. This is a program that'll turn your computer keyboard into an organ keyboard. Okay. You'll need to take out the basic ROM pack to use this one. Ah. Now I'm an organist. But I can only play one note at a time. Is there any way I could play several notes simultaneously for harmony and chords and so on? Yes, there is. Some of these popular micros have a special music chip built in that gives you what are called different voices. Voices? You mean that'll talk to me? No, voices in this case just means the number of notes that the computer can play at the same time. The Atari actually has four musical voices, and the Texas Instruments has three. So does the Commodore VIC-20, and the Commodore 64. And the other computers? With the others, you have to buy a certain amount of extra hardware if you want more than one voice. But let's look at the Texas Instruments now, because it allows you to program its three different voices quite simply. Type one for basic. Okay. Type a line number and call sound. Call sound. Okay, let's see, uh, 10. Call sound. We'll start with one note and then build up. So put in brackets the length of the sound you want, which note you want, high or low, the pitch, and the loudness, the volume. All right, length, pitch, and volume. What, what would I type? Well, let's say that you want the sound to last two seconds. The Texas Instruments computer likes to deal with musical time in milliseconds, thousands of a second. So if you want two seconds, type 2,000 for 2,000 milliseconds. Okay. Bracket. 2,000. Comma. And now the note you want. Uh, how about A? Type 440. That represents the A above middle C. Okay. Okay. Comma. And finally, the volume or loudness you want. Very loud is one, very soft is 30. I think I'll choose pretty loud, three. Close the brackets and press enter. When you run your program, you'll hear A. Hey, but how am I supposed to know that A is 440? Well, there's always a manual that comes with these computers. In the Texas Instruments Manual, called Beginner's Basic, you'll find a list of what are called musical tone frequencies on page 124. Ah, here we are. 440. A above middle C. See if you can program a chord. The chord of C, for instance, which consists of C, E, and G. Okay, don't tell me. Let me try this myself. All right, uh, 10, call, sound, bracket, 
2,000, comma. Okay, now let's see. 262, middle C. 262, comma, and the loudness would be 3. And now we want E, which is 330, comma, at 3. And G, 392. Two, comma, three, and run. It worked. A three-note chord, music by numbers. But I don't understand why I need these particular numbers to stand for the notes that I want. Now I see they're, they're called frequencies. What exactly is a frequency? In order to explain that, we need to explain what goes on inside the computer that enables it to make a sound in the first place. When you take a tuning fork and do this, the prong of the fork vibrates and sets up a sound wave. And when this sound wave hits your eardrum, you can hear the note that is being played by the tuning fork. Now it's easy enough to understand how tuning forks make sounds because you can see the vibrations. But how do computers make sounds? They don't vibrate, do they? No, but they can make other things vibrate. Every time a computer circuit switches on or off, there is a tiny increase or decrease in electric current. It's like a miniature heartbeat that sends out a miniature electrical pulse. This pulse is much too weak to generate any sound on its own, but it can be fed into a tiny device called a transducer to produce a tiny sound. But if we want a louder sound, we must first make the pulse larger. We must amplify it. And this is simple to do, because our computer monitor or TV set comes already equipped with an amplifier. If we feed the computer's pulse into this amplifier, it will then be made large enough to cause a loudspeaker to vibrate, and therefore create a sound wave that we can hear. So, provided that your computer is hooked into an amplifier and a loudspeaker, simply by turning a circuit on or off, you will be able to make a blip sound. Of course, this blip can hardly be called music, but if you tell the computer to switch a circuit on and off more and more rapidly, it will produce a faster and faster string of blips, and eventually, you will hear a musical note. The more frequent the blips, the higher the note. And the less frequent the blips, the lower the note. Which is why the highness or lowness of a note is called its frequency. For example, if we get the computer to turn a circuit on and off precisely 440 times a second, we will hear 440 blips per second, which happens to be the frequency of the musical note A. And this is exactly how a tuning fork, or a piano, or a guitar, or a trumpet, also produces the musical note A, or any other note for that matter. It's all based on vibrations. So your computer can not only give you good words, and good numbers, and good pictures, it can also give you good vibrations. Good vibes, I like that. So a frequency of 440 means that there are 440 vibrations per second? That's right. And if all the computers can make electronic vibrations, does that mean that all computers can produce sounds? Yes, provided that they are connected to some sound-making device, such as a transducer for tiny sounds, or to an amplifier and a loudspeaker for louder sounds. But as I mentioned, only certain of the popular micros come with a built-in music chip that make it possible to synthesize three or four different musical voices. So these music chips are actually music synthesizers, are they? That's right. They are miniature music synthesizers. Of course, if you get more ambitious, you can add much more elaborate synthesizers to your computer. You can buy extra hardware. For example, there's a music synthesizer for the Apple called ELF, which consists of a synthesizer board that we've already plugged into the Apple. Do you see it? It's in slot number four. Oh, I see. So this contains extra music chips. That's right. ALF uses the paddles again, and you also get some software from ALF. Yeah, and I see we have a some special amplifier and speaker. 
Well, why can't we use the amplifier and speaker from the monitor? Well, you could, but the sound wouldn't be as good. Ah, I see. Ah, what have we got here? Well, on this version of ALF, there are three voices, but you can get nine voices in some versions. There are a lot of musical things you can do with ALF, but one of the most interesting is to use it to help you compose music. Compose music? I can't even read music, let alone write it. Well, that's where a system like this can be of help. Why don't you give it a try? The right-hand paddle will move the cursor up and down those lines at the top of the screen. Do you see? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Now, if you were to begin with a high note, position the cursor quite near the top of the lines. Okay. And press the button on the paddle. Hey, I've just written my first note. But it sounds a little high to me, I think. Well, never mind. It's easy to correct. Use the left-hand paddle to move the little arrow along the bottom of the screen. Oh, yes. Position that arrow under the arrow that's pointing to the left. Okay. And press the button. There. This will move the cursor back over the note that you've just written so that you can change it. Oh, I see. Ah, uh, that's much better. I like that. Now move the little arrow under the right-facing arrow so that you can proceed with your tune. You know, this looks just like real music. It is real music. Do you want to hear what the whole thing sounds like? I can hardly wait. Type play and press return. You can set the speed you want your music to be played at by turning the left-hand paddle. Try setting it at 200. Okay, up to 200. Now press the button on the paddle. Vary the speed. Oh, that's terrific. Now I can hear my tune and see it. But you know, it might be premature for me to quit my daytime job. <laughs> Although it was fun. Was that a new way of writing music? Not quite. But eventually, the computer will probably come up with some new way of displaying musical notes. So although it would be quite easy to learn to write traditional music notation with this, if we're moving on to a quite new way of representing music, won't it make the old way obsolete? Well, you have a choice. That's the beauty of the computer. It can either help you to do old things better and more easily, or it can help you to do quite new things. Music, as a highly patterned art, lives through a very rich network of relationships. Let's take two phrases of a well-known tune. Here's the first phrase. Here's the second phrase. What we're doing here in the Logo Music System is to attempt using this special toolkit to build the second phrase from the first phrase. This portion of the second phrase is very much like the first part of the first phrase. Let's take this block and try to make it higher. Not quite right yet. Another step higher ought to do it. And our tune now sounds like this. Again, the next continuation should go something like da da da. We have no existing block with that shape and direction. It does seem as if the second block could conceivably be changed into the missing block if we could somehow turn it upside down. Looking down at the list of operations, we find that indeed there is an operation called invert. Let's try it and see whether that might possibly do the job. Now we have the block going in the proper direction. Ya-ta-tum, 
Indeed, it now goes downward, and it has the right rhythm, but it's a bit too low. Let's add that on to the tune. We now have four blocks in the tune, the initial two and the second two that we have manufactured out of the first two. We have tried to build this kind of a musical universe to explore relationships by actually creating them. Music Land is a group of educational games intended to teach you about music in ways that differ drastically from the conventional. Inside each of these little boxes is a very simplified form of musical notation which represents the music that the box contains. We just move across the word play at the side of the screen and the picture of the Buddha between two loudspeakers warns us that we should be patient, that we're going to hear something. If we don't like a particular fragment of music, we can throw it away simply by shaking the cursor puck and it disappears. Now we can see that we're inside the piece of music and notice that the notes that I've just circled float around on the screen following the movement of my hand. These gadgets here are called sliders and when I stroke this right slider, you watch what happens to the music. It slowly shrinks to nothing and then emerges out the other side of nothing back to front. If I now stroke the other one, watch carefully, you'll see that this shrinks in the vertical dimension. In other words, the pitches are collapsing. Now let's plonk that on the music too. All we've done is to take Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and sprinkle it around the music in slightly transformed ways. <laughs> One can take the first four notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, bom, 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 and then from that, one can, uh, can stretch them in the pitch direction or squeeze them in the time dimension, and just from those first four notes, you can uh, make up the whole of the start of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which is great fun, and I wonder if Beethoven would have done it that way if he'd had the chance. sound generators open up a whole new realm of compositional possibilities. The student is no longer tied to pencil and paper, he's no longer tied to conventional instruments. He can learn to create sound, he can learn to pile sound upon sound, he can learn to understand sound electronically. In effect, he has a modern electronic laboratory at his fingertips, something that most of us in the classroom heretofore have not been able to offer our students. It enables me to take maybe a small fragment of a song or a song that I've written and program it into the computer in layers but then I can play it back and hear the whole composition as one as if a band was playing my composition back to me. Francis is working with a computer assisted instruction package called the Apple Music Theory. She's using it to develop her recognition of oral intervals. By using the computer this way, she is free to practice this recognition at her leisure. The teacher doesn't have to be there all the time. The computer does it all. It corrects you when you're wrong, and it tells you you're right when you're right. And it keeps records of your progress, so you can see what you've done and how you've improved. We're not intending to replace the normal playing of flute, clarinet, and trumpet with something new. What we're trying to do is expand the horizons of our students to be able to tap into the electronic resources that are available to them and to become directly involved in the process of creating music and sound. This is all very impressive, but I notice that it all involves a certain amount of extra hardware and software, the Alpha Centauri, or the ALF, and so on. And that must get expensive. But if I go back to a basic microcomputer, as it comes from the store, the music I get is rather... tinny, isn't it? It's like a flat, buzzing sort of sound. Well, most of the music chips that come built into a computer are pretty limited. 
but there is one exception. The music chip on the Commodore 64. Oh, the Commodore 64. I haven't tried this one before. Type 5 to play sample. And try number 5. That's quite pleasant. Yeah, that's pretty good. There were three different voices playing that. Three different instruments, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Now, you can change the instruments, if you like. Press return. Okay. And now zero to select envelope. Oh, okay. Well, I'll try uh, accordion and organ and xylophone. But it's different. I like them. And there are other ways in which you can vary the sounds of the 64. Press the run stop key and the restore key. And type load, music in quotes, comma eight, and return. Run and return. The first thing that this program does is turn the top two rows of keys into piano keys. Oh. Mm -hmm. If you press the space bar, you'll get what they're calling a polyphonic sound, a sort of echo. Oh, yeah. I like that. Now try the F keys. These are function keys that allow you to do additional things on the computer. Try F3. It'll lower the notes by an octave. Oh, yes, it does. I'll try F5. That takes me down another octave. F7. Way down there. So actually, I have four octaves at my disposal. That's right. Now go back to F1. Now try the other function keys. F2, 4, 6, 8. You get them by holding down the shift key. Like a bell. Yeah. It's kind of twangy. Oh, it's muted. And that's very harsh. It's like gunfight at the OK Corral. <laughs> yes. The music chip on this machine lets you change a number of variables. The tempo, the octaves, the waveform, the envelopes. What do you mean by waveform and envelope? I'm afraid I'm getting a bit lost here. Well, these are important terms in computer music. The best way to understand them is to look at how a music chip or music synthesizer actually works. Someone once said that architecture is frozen music. And this is more than just a pretty phrase. Because if we take the sounds produced by different musical instruments and freeze them, we will see that frozen music does look rather like architecture. Some sound waves look like a row of pyramids. Some like a string of mud huts. And others are a jumble of all sorts of shapes and sizes. Now let's take a typical computer sound and freeze that. A row of little boxes. It looks as boring and repetitive as it sounds. All the boxes are the same shape. The waveforms are all square. And they are all the same size. There's no variation in their volume. This is because the switching on and off of a computer circuit can only produce sound waves that are either completely on or completely off. In order to improve the quality of computer sound, you need to add a music synthesizer chip. This synthesizer can create a range of waveforms, from sawtooth waves to triangular waves to mellow sine waves. It can also vary the volume of these waves, not just to sound louder or softer, but also to give each note an individual contour or sound envelope. 
This enables you to imitate a guitar, for example, whose notes have a waveform like this, and an envelope like this, which starts quickly and fades quickly. Or a trumpet, which produces a waveform like this, and an envelope like this, which starts slowly, but can be sustained for a long time. And that's how, by manipulating various combinations of different waveforms and envelopes, a computer equipped with a music synthesizer can synthesize or put together the basic elements of any sound you like so that you can turn your computer into a flute or a violin or a xylophone or some instrument that no one's ever thought of before. There's no limit to the new forms of musical architecture that you can dream of. Right, so computer music is entertaining, it's educational, and it can put a whole orchestra at your fingertips in a way. And when you think of it, sound is really an integral part of the computer. Every time you turn a computer on, you usually hear some sort of sound. That's true. And when I press return, it speaks to me. But can any of these computers actually talk? I mean, can they imitate the sound of human speech? Oh, yes. Most microcomputers can be equipped with voice synthesizers just as they can with music synthesizers. There's an example on the Texas Instruments computer. Hello, Billy. Wow! How are you? That's unbelievable. <laughs> In our next episode, We'll look at the computer at work and some down-to-earth applications. Word processing, using electronic spreadsheets such as VisiCalc. And we'll also examine various types of printers and plotters that can be used with the computer. Until then, I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bytes. And I am the only man see you soon. <laughs>